Sergeant, please start your recordings. PC recording on the way. Cloud recording rolling. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Martinez, you may begin with your opening statement. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Economic Development, jointly with the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. All right, we're ready to roll, Sergeant. Yes, sir. All right, good morning, everyone. And a big thank you to our security team, Carl and the Sergeant. You know, you guys had to take on many roles and now you're technology experts on top of everything else. So uh, we thank you for keeping us safe when we were in City Hall and also keeping these virtual hearings moving. Not an easy task, especially with this crew that's on board. Look at Jimmy and I are ready to go. So you guys are in big trouble. So good morning. Welcome everyone to this joint hearing between the New York City Council Committees on Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations. Today is Monday, November 15th, 2021. My name is Paul Vallone, and I've had the privilege of chairing the Committee on Economic Development. I'd also like to extend my thanks to my dear friend and co-chair, Jimmy Van Bramer, who's here this morning with his entire uh, council crew who's joining with him, as well as the members of both committee committees, the administration and the city's official tourism and marketing organization, New York City and Company, for coming together to hold this hearing, which we've been doing for over the last four years now. We have been joined by uh, a whole bunch of good, great council members this morning. We have council member Baron, Cornegie, Dharma Diaz, a majority leader, Lori Cumbo, Jim Gennaro, I see on, Peter Koo, council member Jonai, Lewis, Moya, and Powers. Uh, okay, so this hearing marks the culmination of several tourism related hearings that these two committees have held throughout the course of this council session. I believe I can speak for both committees when I say we take tremendous pride in directing the council's attention towards the tourism sector over the last four years, a sector of the economy that drives so much economic activity in our, in our city, but often was overlooked as it straddled several different areas of the city's workforce. I can say that between council member Van Bramer and I, it is no longer overlooked. In fact, we made a priority for budget and for legislation. Over the last four years, our two communities have been here to address the issues facing the tourism industry, Head on, beginning with the offsite hearing, which we really enjoyed, at the TWA Hotel showroom on the 86th floor of One World Trade. Several bills aimed at improving the city's tourist experience and the tourism economy and continuing through the darkest days of the pandemic and the gradual recovery that we have been going through at this point. The goal of today's hearing is to hear from our colleagues at New York City and Company and the Department of Cultural Affairs about how their efforts have improved the tourist economy in the city over the last year and a half but specifically how those efforts have borne fruit during the course of the last quarter, as indoor dining has become more normalized, museums, shows, and cultural institutions have reopened with international tourism that just began this month. The last time our two committees met on this topic was in September 2020, when vaccines were not yet available and the prospects for return to a normal seemed bleak back in those days. In the years since, over 80, 87% of city adults have received at least one dose of the vaccine and admittance to indoor dining of cultural attractions is as simple as showing a vaccine card. And let me say for the crew that's on here, thank you, because in those darkest days, it was this crew that really did lead the way uh, when everyone was looking for what to do first, not next, but first. Um, and EDC, New York and Company, uh, and these great team that are here uh, worked tirelessly to make sure the city did see the light that is happening now. Uh, just last week, the city's airport celebrated the return of vaccinated international tourists and major attractions like Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall have offered to admit travelers with any vaccine approved by the WHO, not just those authorized for use by the CDC. It seems like things are starting to approve and return to some state of normal. 
And we on the committees are looking forward a bit of a deeper dive into that new data. Some of the questions for today's hearing, well, how, is, how has the reopening driven up tourist numbers? How close are hotel occupancy levels to returning back to normal? What sort of attendance are we seeing in the city's many shows, museums, and cultural attractions? Also, what lessons can we learn from other countries as they have been reopening across the globe? The United States may have lagged in permitting international tourists to come back, but that doesn't mean we can't hit the ground running and getting tourists here now that we're once again open for business. We on the committees would like to reiterate our support for New York City and company and the Herculean efforts it has undertaken throughout this crisis in keeping New York's tourist economy above water. I hope as we begin to emerge from the pandemic is that NYC and company and its many partners can you can continue to draw tourists back to New York and ensure that its many world class attractions recover as quickly and safely as possible. With that said, I'd like to acknowledge the academic development team here at the council. Committee, Council Alex Polinoff with his shiny new beard, policy analyst William Hognock, and finance analyst Aliyah Ali, who as she has been stood by our side for all these years, and commend them on all their hard work preparing for this hearing throughout the entire session. In addition, I have my chief of staff, Jonathan Shutt, my deputy chief of staff, Ahmed Nazar, and my legislative director, Kevin Kropowski, who has been tirelessly keeping me sounding and looking good over these last four years. I will now turn the floor over to my co-chair, council member, Jimmy Van Bramer, and a friend of the Malone family for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Vallone. And indeed, it is always a pleasure to work alongside uh, yourself. As you alluded to, I am a son of Astoria, Queens, and uh, grew up knowing uh, Speaker Peter Vallone as my local council member. And uh, my mother is among the many people who absolutely adore uh, Speaker Vallone. But uh, I am... Uh, grateful for your service and the work that we've done together uh, and your friendship. Uh, you've uh, acknowledged all the members of the Cultural Affairs Committee, uh, and I thank them and, of course, all the council members who have joined us here today. Uh, as Chair Vallone mentioned, we have had a laser-like focus on tourism, and you cannot talk about uh, tourism in the city of New York without, of course, talking about culture and the arts because they are uh, so interwoven and so linked. And we all remember uh, those dark days in March of 2020 uh, when uh, everything began that painful process of shutting down uh, all in-person programming performances and uh, and while culture never closed and the culture at three call quickly uh, sprung up and, and the arts community uh, banded together, uh, we saw something that we thought we would never see, uh, which is the stage at Carnegie Hall uh, go dark and uh, the halls of the Met and so many of our local outer borough cultural arts organizations, um, not see uh, people admiring the art, the performances, the shows that of course impacted artists uh, and those folks, many of whom uh, lost their sources of income uh, because the arts is such an incredible driver of employment and economic activity. Um, but we're also seeing, uh, which is so exciting, uh, a rebirth. And I was there uh, along with my husband, Dan, at Carnegie Hall's uh, opening night uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, it was magical in all the ways that culture and the arts makes New York City a magical place. Uh, we wore tuxedos that night and we took the train in. And as we were getting off at the stop, uh, at Carnegie, there were two women looking at us from across the train. And as we got up, they said, you guys look really, really great tonight. Like, where are you going? And we said, we're going to Carnegie Hall. And I told folks that night at the, at the reception, it's one of those moments that happens in New York City, right? And it doesn't happen unless we're open. It doesn't happen unless the arts are thriving and, and folks are going to Carnegie Hall. Um, I also wanted to share a personal story because my, my husband's niece 
and best friend are visiting this weekend. So we've had two 21 year olds, Paul, in the house uh, for <laughs> four days. And uh, I know that feeling well. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. Um, and uh, and it's been great. So they were able to uh, uh, go to the Met on Saturday. They're at uh, um, Ellis Island today. But in addition to that, of course, they went shopping in, in Brooklyn and uh, we've taken them out to eat uh, all over Queens. And that's what happens when people come to New York, right? They, they enjoy the city. Uh, they take in all of the cultural offerings. They also shop. They drive the economy. Um, jobs, of course, come back. So it's, um, it's been a difficult stretch for everyone on uh, this call and in this hearing but uh, so much is possible now and that's why it's so important for us to continue the work that chair valone and i've done in focusing on tourism and um and uh, the success story that it, it was before uh, the pandemic and uh, the success story that i believe it will be again um and so it's very exciting to think about the fact that we'll get back to 60, 65 million tourists uh, a year in the city of New York and what that means uh, in terms of jobs and economic uh, development. But uh, for now, I just want to thank uh, everyone before they get into their testimony. and We get into our questions for everything they've done in keeping this city uh, alive. Uh, I want to also thank in particular my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, and our committee's uh, principal uh, financial analyst, Alia Ali, who already got a great shout out from Cher Valone, but our policy analyst, Christy Dwyer is on uh, the call and she's equally wonderful, as is our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney, who is of course taking care of two amazing little uh, babies uh, that have just joined us in the world. So uh, we send love to Brenda and the family. And with that, I will turn it back over to Cher Valone. Well, I thank uh, Alex back to the council so we can continue on with the format and then we can swear in our first panelists. And thank you, uh, Chair Jimmy Van Bramer. Looking forward to today's hearing. Yeah, and I think that Jimmy mentioned it right. This, is, this topic has been the number one hearing between both committees for during our term together, which shows you how uh, important these topics and these issues have been individually to us as a council and for the city. Um, no other hearing topic has been heard as much as this as we went before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now as we come out of the pandemic. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as the Chair has mentioned, I am Alex Polinoff, counsel to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council, and I'll be the moderator for today's hearing. Before we begin testimony, I just wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration and New York City and company who are testifying will not be muted during the question and answer portion of administration's testimony. I will be calling on panelists to testify in order, so please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be Donna Karen, Executive Vice President of Research and Insight at New York City and Company. Uh, and New York City and Company's Chief Marketing Officer, Nancy Mamana, will also be available for questioning as well. Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg from the Department of Cultural Affairs and Assistant Vice President of Portfolio Management, Bianca Sosa at the New York City Economic Development Corporation will also be available for questioning. I will call upon each of you shortly for the oath and then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions for five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Uh, please note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be permitting a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. Before we begin the testimony period, I will administer the oath. To all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hands now. I will read you the oath and then call on each of you individually for a response. 
you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Vice President Karen. I do. Chief Marketing Officer Mamana. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Feinberg. Yes, I do. Assistant Vice President Sosa. Yes, I do. Thank you. Executive Vice President Karen, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Vallone, Chairman Van Bramer, and members of the Committees on Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, as well as members of the City Council. I am Dr. Donna Karen, Executive Vice President of Research and Insights, and I'm joined today by Nancy Mamana, our Chief Marketing Officer at NYC and Company, testifying on behalf of our CEO, Fred Dixon. We thank you for this opportunity to share the current status of the city's tourism and hospitality industry and NYC and Company's efforts, along with our government and private sector partners, to resuscitate the industry as we work towards economic recovery. I would like to provide a quick background on who we are and what we do as an organization. NYC and Company is the official excuse me, destination marketing and tourism organization, as well as the Convention and Visitors Bureau for the five boroughs of New York City. Our mission is to maximize inbound travel and tourism opportunities throughout the city, build economic prosperity, and spread the dynamic image of the five boroughs around the world. We are a 501c6 private, not-for-profit member organization and represent the interests of nearly 2,000 member businesses and organizations from the five boroughs. We are governed by an 85-member board of directors representing a diverse range of businesses from across the city. Our members range from hotels, cultural organizations, restaurants and attractions to bids and chambers of commerce. Together, they fund about half our operations. We also hold a procurement contract with the Department of Small Business Services to provide the city of New York with certain tourism marketing services. Travel and tourism has long been a driver of economic prosperity for New York City with direct and indirect impacts in all five boroughs. 2019 marked the 10th consecutive year of growth in the number of visitors, and importantly, in visitor spending, business revenues, job creation, new investments, and city tax revenue. However, the pandemic crippled the tourism and hospitality industry once normal operations came to a halt. Our global community fractured as borders were closed and convenings of any size became impossible. Let me give you a snapshot of the economic costs and losses the city endured during the first year of the pandemic. Combined domestic and international visitation dropped by 65% and visitor spending decreased by 66%. This translated to a greater than 50% loss in jobs and a $2 billion decrease in local tax revenues from all sources. Tourism supported hotel room demand, always a leading indicator for economic impact, fell by 69% in calendar 2020. With hotel taxes down by at least 500 million to the general fund. These enormous losses were aggravated by the closing of the U.S. borders as international markets account for 50% of room nights and almost half of all visitor spending across the city. Given this reduction in visitation and spending since March 2020, especially by overnight travel and international visitors, the city's leisure and hospitality sector has lost more jobs than the finance, information, real estate, and professional and business services sectors combined. Leisure and hospitality jobs were down by 50%, which represents over 230,000 jobs lost last year. 
as you may know, a significant proportion of the tourism workforce also lives in neighborhoods throughout the city. Many of them work in small businesses that provide key inputs to the visitor experience from wholesalers to event specialists to local tour guides and startups. The tourism eco ecosystem spreads benefits at every level. Restaurants and bars, which rely on visitors for about one third of their revenues have been most affected in terms of actual number of jobs lost. A loss of at least 105,000 jobs as of September this year, still down by more than one third from their 2019 peaks. It was good news when seated dining became available and then indoor dining returned. The industry has been adding jobs, but remains as risk, at risk as the winter weather returns. On the other hand, the smaller in numbers, the arts, entertainment, cultural, and recreation sector has been hardest hit. Given the attraction of the city's cultural community to visitors, six in 10 jobs in the sector are supported by visitor spending. As a result, in September, even as Broadway, live events, and museums are open across the boroughs, jobs in this sector remain at historic lows, 25,000 jobs below 2019 levels. That's 28% below benchmark. This sector remains critical to the city's image and recovery. Active hotel inventory also remains down compared to pre-pandemic levels. Even as new hotels have opened and properties across the five boroughs have reopened to visitors. The employment situation in this sector remains 32% below 2019 levels, hitting just 219,000 jobs in September this year, still more than 100,000 jobs below earlier levels. The return of domestic visitors has driven occupancy rates to an annual average of just 55%. The sector remains at risk as the recovery of business and international travel will take several years to regain peak levels. Throughout these uncertain times, NYC and Company remains pivotal to the city and the industry by connecting, convening, and supporting critical sectors of the economy from the earliest days of the pandemic. In June 2020, we brought together key stakeholders from across sectors and the boroughs, including public health partners to establish the Coalition for New York City Hospitality and Tourism Recovery. The first objective of the coalition was to create a tourism recovery plan. And in July, 2020, we released All In NYC, the roadmap for tourism's reimagining and recovery. Utilizing our strength as the city's destination marketing organization Major components of this plan included our continuing local and resident revitalization campaign, All in NYC, our health initiative, the Stay Well NYC Pledge, tactics for our renewed commitment to diversity and inclusivity, in, especially in lifting up New York City's BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities. We put hyper-local exploration and experiences along with staycation messaging at the forefront of our initiatives until domestic business and ultimately international travel could resume. As the US opens our borders to international markets, New York City is regaining its rightful place as the top international destination, bringing global visitors who stay longer and do more dining, shopping, visiting museums and historic sites and attending live performances or sporting events in the city. Through, st through strategic government investment in our work, we have been able to maintain our presence and messaging in key global markets, ready to pivot to welcoming domestic and international visitors once again. This much needed government funding has expanded our marketing reach and research capabilities. Therefore, we are grateful to Senate Majority Leader Schumer for ensuring New York City receive significant funds from the American Rescue Plan, 
We would like to thank the mayor for making a historic investment in our work and Chairman Ballone for speaking at the mayor's presser announcing the city's first investment in tourism recovery. Now, Nancy Mamana will share our 2021 marketing campaigns and vibrancy programs that continue to revitalize the travel and tourism industry. Nancy. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to share our work with you today. On June 24th, we launched our global It's Time for New York City campaign, which is the largest multi-phase global tourism marketing and advertising campaign ever created for New York City. It's Time for New York City was rolled out as restrictions began to lift, more people were getting vaccinated, and travel resumed in the U.S. and beyond. The campaign reminds visitors of the city's unrivaled energy, excitement, and the abundance of endless experiences and resiliency that make New York City the most iconic destination in the world. Designed to create urgency and FOMO, the fear of missing out, it's time for New York City campaign has three phases. It includes television, digital, outdoor media, and partnerships of several types. To date, three commercials have launched asking first, where were you in the summer of 2021? followed by Lights Up, which celebrates the fall return of Broadway, performing arts and culture, and our third highlighting the holiday season, which just launched the first week of November. The mayor continues to show his support by including us in his pressers to showcase our commercials and celebrate the return of tourism and vitality to the city. In addition to our media, we have joined forces with important travel partners to drive actionable results. We began in June with a partnership with AAA, targeting the Northeast drive market, followed by American Airlines in July, targeting the longer haul US domestic market, and Amtrak targeting the Acela Corridor from October through Q1 of next year. We also followed up our 2020 New York City Misses You Too out of home campaign internationally with a New York City is ready for you creative messaging, which replaced it in the UK, Mexico, Japan, and Sweden, in part to help fulfill our contractual requirement with the city to utilize our JC Deco media allocation, but also to help keep New York City top of mind as travelers began considering their next destination. When the federal government announced the November 8th reopening to vaccinated travelers, we immediately began expanding our efforts by developing international media campaigns and partnerships with airlines and tour operators in key markets. Those partnerships include British Airways, which launched in London on November 8th, and then Porter Airlines in Canada, Aeromexico in Mexico, CVC in Brazil, and six other partnerships that will be live by Q4 2021. Other markets will follow in Q1 of next year. Throughout the pandemic, we have continued our engagement with locals and tri-state visitors and commuters through our annual vibrancy campaigns designed to help promote the energy and attractiveness of our local tourism and hospitality businesses during need periods. Since its inception in summer 1992, NYC Restaurant Week, held in both January and February as well as July and August, has been a celebration of dining, bringing people together for a shared experience of food, drinks, and camaraderie. Taking into consideration the vulnerability of the restaurant industry, we made it economically feasible for any restaurant to participate, receiving the largest number of five borough participants ever. On the heels of Restaurant Week's continued success, NYC and Company has launched seasonal vibrancy programs, including the twice annual Broadway Week and New York City Off-Broadway Week with two for one tickets to some of the hottest shows in town, as well as those shows at Broadway and smaller theaters across the boroughs, as well as NYC Must See Week, which offers two for one tickets to nearly 70 attractions, museums, tours, and performing arts. These programs have attracted visitors from the tri-state region and beyond and are economic drivers during what is typically a slower period. We are continuing that with It's Time for Culture, which just wrapped in October, which was really designed to highlight all of the variety of cultural attractions available to throughout the five boroughs, large and small. And we are also following up with a push around our local businesses and holiday shopping and retail this November and December. In January, we will also be bringing back New York City Winter Outing, which is a combination of NYC Restaurant Week, Broadway Week, Must See Week, and the newly added NYC Hotel Week, which we will begin promoting in December for planning purposes. By combining all programs into our broader platform and under one messaging umbrella, we expand the reach of the message to drive day trips as well as valuable overnight visitors and traffic to these businesses across the city. 
as we rejoice with the successful return of Broadway, performing arts, nightlife, music, and sports venues, the industry is still challenged as not all international borders have reopened, business meetings and conferences have not fully returned, and the coronavirus variants remain a threat to our new normal. NYC and company will continue to support our industry by stimulating demand from hyperlocal, regional, national, and now international visitors. This will require continued smart policymaking and investment from our government partners, as well as sharing in real time public health guidelines with all of our audiences. We knew this would be a marathon and not a sprint and are steeled for the long road ahead to a full economic recovery. However, without a stable long-term funding strategy, we'll be fall behind on our competitors affecting our mission to build economic prosperity and share all that each borough has to offer around the world. Thank you for allowing this time to testify. As always, we appreciate the council's support of the industry and being partners with us in this work. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karen and Ms. Mamana. I will now turn it over to questions from the chairs. Uh, panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. And a reminder to both chairs that you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourself during this period. Uh, thank you. Chair Vallone, you may begin. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karen and Nancy. Boy, that was a lot of information. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and that's how you get prepared for a hearing. Um, you know, in some respects, it's not fair, right? Because Broadway just reopened this Labor Day in November. We just had international tourists come back. So it's, it's difficult for us to say, okay, tell us where we are and let's, let's hopefully it's all back to 100%. Clearly it's not. But we, we thank you so much because when the entire country and the world shut down, so much of it turned to you and your team um, who also was devastated with budget cuts and employee cuts. And yet through that, you managed with the All in New York and now with the new campaign um, with the three phases that uh, Nancy just talked about. I think those are some of the bright lights that will bring us back. I, I really wanted to give this time for you to, to elaborate on some of that data that you just gave us. And because it is Council Member Van Bramer and I, as we come to the end of our terms, and as much as we don't want to go, we're kind of being have to go, there will be new chairs. And what I hope to do is lay that format for the future chairs to take this type of hearing and the amount of work we've done together to keep the momentum going and keep the development of the new partnership. Because I really think it is a new partnership between government and the work that you've been doing. In the beginning, we had to kind of wrap our hands around all the things uh, New York and company and EDC were doing within the tourism and the hospitality and cultural. Um, but now it's, it's the synchronicity between City Hall and those agencies. And I, I don't, I'd hate for that to go backwards. So I think it's so important for today's hearing and the hearings and the work we've done before, and as Chair Van Bramer will say also with his questions, that we take the steps and continue forward. So I guess for, for the New York company, team, how would you envision that governmental relation that we've kind of nurtured together through City Hall? What is it that you need to continue the rebound from uh, your city partner to make sure that the rebound continues? I, I think at, at the most basic level, uh, it would be really just supporting these businesses in any way you can as a New Yorker. Um, that is at the core, and that is something we live and breathe every day as well, uh, to patronize these businesses, and also anything you could do to help support our messaging and amplify what we're doing. Every day in our channels, you'll see us promoting local businesses and across our network uh, in every borough, and really anything you could do to tag us and support our and amplify our messaging uh, is, is truly grateful. We, we agree that we've made amazing progress and have seen incredible collaboration and partnership with our partners at DCLA and EDC and with the council. And we also look forward to continuing that momentum. It's critical as we move forward. And it's been amazing to see, especially over the last uh, year of, of how we've really come together. We, and we have seen that we are stronger as a combined voice. Uh, so we, we also look forward to that continuing. You know, Nancy, I guess one of the things that we could continue immediately is the work with our fellow New Yorkers and, and within the tri-state, the, the domestic visitation. Do you think we reached, you know, I guess, where are we since international just started? It's really not fair. I mean, we can kind of uh, take some shots at what we think will be. But where do we think we are with the numbers with domestic 
visitation into the city? Have, have we reached the pre-pandemic numbers and like, where are we today and how can we reach that maximum? Because uh, we're going to still be so dependent on our fellow New Yorkers and within the tri-state to come back to New York. Uh, let me take a, a small stab at that. We have come back quite remarkably, particularly in the second half of this year as the rate of vaccination has spread in our city, in our region and across the country. We are having as many of our members in arts and culture, in dining and other uh, parts of the city will tell you very strong weekend performance. That is a drive market and local coming into the city for what we have on offer. We will take at least another year or two to fully complement that domestic market, the long haul traveler who needs to fly here, the business traveler who is dealing not only with the pandemic, but also with the concerns of their corporations and management about spending. And this is a pattern that will take us a couple of years, but we have certainly opened the faucet and are seeing the positive results of the collective efforts of our government partners in supporting the pandemic safety and our business partners in travel and tourism as they have adopted these same policies and practices. So you, you think, Doctor, that maybe within a year or two, we'll, we'll hopefully get back to where our domestic numbers were pre-pandemic? Uh, my current forecast is domestic will be breaking through old records before the end of 2023. Um, things well, can always turn out faster. If, if the families of myself and Councilman Van Bramer are, are any example, we shall be hitting those numbers sooner rather than <laughs> since we love to visit. And come. We will encourage you to encourage your families. <laughs> Thank you for that. The holidays are right around the corner and we're already getting the, what are we doing in the next two to four weeks? So we have that all ready to go. Um, I would say you just brought up some of the business partners and, and so much of that is dependent on the hotel industry and that. there's so many sub sectors within that you have to keep your handle on. Um, do you see, I'm still seeing some very high vacancy rates, I guess, within the hotel industry. Some of, some of the complaints or some of the concerns during the pandemic were the state and not so much city, but state and city uh, limitations and regulations that made it so difficult to, to rent out uh, events to a space and, and bring in folks and we you know there's vacancy and there were there uh, were different type of vaccination requirements and different type of meeting requirements and limitations. Do you see that there are still some um, limitations on a state level and or the city that we could help in, in not so much removing or easing or are we back to pre-pandemic of the, the limitations that were set by government? Donnie, you wanna take that one? I, I think that there are the, I have to say that I would need to get back to you on some of the very, very specific changes, things that are still in development, but we are seeing that events are taking place at the Javits Center, meetings and events are taking place in large venues across the city. The uh, mandates for vaccination and mask wearing in our arts and cultural institutions has gone from what we have observed outside of that particular institution seems to be going very well. And it does appear that our travelers for the most part have adjusted to that, that they will show proof of vaccine, that they will in fact stay masked in a theater or a museum and limit the time they have their masks down in an indoor dining establishment. So it's 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 a work in progress. But if we could figure if there, because I know that that one limitation of a limit of fifty people into a um, a meeting hall was disastrous for some of our hotels and some of our local venues, even Jacob Javits, that couldn't bring that. And, and the easing of that type of restriction is is monumental. And trying to bring those groups back. Do you? 
do you see, I guess, the even with Jacob Javits, I know there's just, I think there's less than 20 different events planned for the year. Um, is, I guess, is most of those domestic bookings and we, we're not able to tap into the international bookings yet. And, um, when do we see, hopefully, that we can start seeing some of our fellow travelers from across the world in Europe come back to us? I think with the government opening to vaccinated international travelers with a negative test, we will begin to see both the buyers and sellers, the attendees and the exhibitors at these large events begin to pick up. Um, and we know that our development team in the Javits and our member hotels are working very hard on attracting the kind of business that will help support New York City travel and tourism. Well, I think those are, and I guess, Nancy, if there's anything in there you can add into, I, I think with the unemployment rates and, and the vacancy rates um, where they are, right, this is, this is a critical time to, to turn, that, turn that around. Do you see anything, I guess the partnership for one is, is key and we've had that, but the bringing back of the jobs that have been at such a low rate, I think, I think uh, Doctor mentioned that it was still over 200,000 for those who within this industry that are unemployed. What is a key factor of bringing back those who were previously employed in the sector, but now is still having those lower rates? Uh, I know with tourism increases, that will be alleviated, but I, I don't know how much longer some of those folks can wait. So is with some of the stimulus funding and some of the federal and state programs that are coming in, is there anything short term that we can see to maybe help those who are, are still unemployed in the sector? Yeah, I think from our perspective, what we've been waiting for to complete the puzzle has just occurred with the international border reopening. That is really the missing piece. Um, we, we just can't get to full recovery without that. With international travelers historically being 20% of the visitation and room nights, but 50% of the spend has had an enormous impact, as we all know. So now that that's occurred, we really have uh, dove in with um, with a pretty robust plan of partnerships uh, across travel partners in our, in our key markets and beyond to help generate that traffic back. So we've got 10 partnerships in the making with all of our key feeder markets with either airlines or tour operators. Clearly it's the leisure segment first, but there is a lot of pent up demand and we've, we're very bullish, but what we're hearing from British Airways with the first partnership to roll out, you may have seen our event that we had last Monday, a lot of, a lot of interest. I think their routes from what we're understanding from them are sold out for the holiday season. So we do think we're, we're, we're on our way back. We've taken that last step of the concentric circle approach. We, we finally see the last circle. So that, that, that's, we're in the beginning, I think, of what we might begin to see some, some real change and impact with that. It may take several months for us to, to completely bear out, but we do think we will be going to see a difference uh, this holiday season and into Q2 of next year. So really that's what we've been waiting for. Yeah, I think that's why we said at the beginning, it's, it's kind of unfair since a lot of this has just started in the last quarter to kind of to, to hope for it perfectly back to 100%. We know that's not the case, but I guess we're trying to create that groundwork with through the legislation and or budget and that partnership to make sure that turnaround is as quickly as possible. I, I don't want, especially even budget, right? I mean, but the budget for New York and company was, was devastated as, as this progression through the pandemic and, and back, and you guys have had to do this on small staff. Um, have you been able to, to revamp and recover a little bit through your own budget and through some of the stimulus funding and funding that's come through? And, and I guess, where are you today based on how difficult it got about a year ago? The, the, the stimulus funding that we received was a was a game changer for us. Um, it absolutely has helped bolster our efforts and do things that we have not been able to do in the past. We, we always had partnerships with international airlines and tour operators, but not to this scale and depth. Uh, we've not done television advertising, at least not in several years. Um, so all of this work is largely because of the funds that we were uh, lucky enough to receive. So we are, uh, yeah, it was a game changer for us and it did allow us to uh, hire back some of our staff, not all, but enough to have the resources to do the work. And we expect that to continue taking us through to Q2 
uh, with those campaigns. So we, we just look forward to future ways of, of continuing the momentum uh, as we know that the recovery will be ongoing after that. But, uh, but it absolutely has allowed us to go very deep and wide with our efforts uh, because of that funding. And it definitely um, it, it made us uh, a lot more, I think, impactful in terms of the reach uh, that we were able to achieve because of that campaign and really uh, delving into media outlets and countries at a level that we had not been able to previously do. So, so we're very fortunate and really just looking ahead at how we can maintain the momentum after that. Do you think that the funding will carry over to next year for, for continued use within the budget, or are we going to reach a, a point where that won't be the case? Yeah, it's it's meant to carry our international efforts, so we have reserved some to continue into next year, just based on the timing of the border reopening. So uh, it should sunset in June. Um, after that, we'll, we'll need to look at other ways to, to try to um, maintain that level, and then some uh, on, a, on a more consistent basis. But uh, we were we were intending for for much of that, and we we had reserved. Uh, some of those funds to make sure that we were getting it to market internationally when the time was right. So, so now we're we're in the process of deploying that. But yeah, I think I think through June we'll be we'll be spending those funds. Well, now you know why we were working so hard to try to get some additional revenue uh, streams for New York yeah. and Company. I know EDC is with us today, and I'm going to ask them at the very end, just a couple of minutes, on how they envision their budget through assisting because so much. Of the work you do is dependent on that budget. And I was always trying to work um, with your team to try to find other avenues so that if this a day like this did come, thank God for the stimulus, but I, I wanted to be able to give you that continued because we can't have you. Uh, so at a depleted force, we need so much of the work. And I think I'll just, since as you mentioned the new campaign, I remember standing in, in uh, Bay Plaza talking about the all in New York and telling everyone to come to Bell Boulevard and back to New York City. And as Jimmy did in, in his district, and we were all saying, come on back. And that played a big part saying, to letting people know it's okay just to come back outside and then to come back to businesses. And now you mentioned that the It's Time for New York City campaign. Is, is the all in campaign um, transitioned into the new campaign or is there any segments that are left over and did you have any like final numbers from the all in is there anything that you wanted to expand on that we we did transition from all in into its time uh but we are still seeing some social content using the all in nyc hashtag that was really designed for locals as you know at that time we were very much talking to our residents to steal them and to celebrate their resiliency then as we opened up uh, to speak to visitors, we we just kind of evolved into its time, which is really outward, more outwardly facing. And it was really designed to give folks the permission to visit. We did quite a bit of market research, qualitative and quantitative. And at that time, the biggest hurdle was that people were not sure if everything was open and if they should come and if it was time to come and you know what, what would be open when they arrived. And there was a lot of confusion and there was some uh, hesitancy. So we went very hard. Uh, with that message with its time to very much uh, come forward with the fact that it is time to visit and give them the permission to come now while we could still capitalize on the summer season. So if you see all the content, it's, it's, it's almost in real time that we've shot all around the boroughs with what is happening now to demonstrate the vibrancy. We wanted to show people, not tell people. Uh, and it was very much about uh, making sure people were aware of what was happening, that they understood our protocols, but that they should come now. And we, we, we knew that we needed to maintain a very aggressive message to stay top of mind for travelers who at that time were perhaps looking to go to beaches and mountains and things like that. You know, we wanted to make sure they knew that you, what you really want to do, you've probably had enough of being alone. You really want to come here where the vibrancy uh, is and where the people are and all the energy is that you've been craving. So the content in the campaign is a very different one from All In. Uh, so we did open it up and we do imagine continuing to use this likely through the end of next year. Um, and then obviously we'll look forward into an evolved message after that. But it's 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 a, a broad and simple enough as All In was meant to be to encapsulate a lot of different messages and extend into a lot of different campaigns. So again, it's time for culture just launched in October and we'll be continuing to house everything we do under its time um, for for at least and through next year, and then we'll we'll look to shift messaging hopefully again to uh, a different message when its time is no longer needed, and we look we look forward to that. Well, you know, and I, I know Chair Van Bramer is going to have so many 
questions on on the on the micro level and the macro level there's so many things we talked about but so many of his bills were were instrumental in getting the open streets and cultural programs to benefit also we saw the opportunity for that uh we benefited that and some of that is a direct partnership between city government and and edc and new york and company so those are are direct things that we can work on together to make sure that the, the good parts of those programs continue and how we can make them better. Um, I'll just, I saw that Tom Ferrugia is here from the Broadway League and I see Times Square Alliance and they both put some great testimony in. And I just wanted, I guess, for the fact that we have the first panel, when you, when you look at their testimony, I know Tom's going to mention it, it's, it's surprisingly similar in, in the positives and, and what they see as some of the local constraints, I guess, in bringing us back to 100%. And the two, the thing that I noticed on both was the first that was mentioned for Ms. Wright and for Tom was that the city is safe and welcoming. And I, I know it is such a difficult task for NYC and company, but it does bring forth the partnership with bids and the local police departments and the city to, to, can, to provide that type of environment. Do you just want to give you a minute to what your thoughts might be on how we can help to continue to provide that level of comfort and safety that's needed within the tourism industry. I know that um, both Keith Bowers and I were, were very excited in enacting 1811, which gave Times Square Alliance and the, the local industry to, to kind of zone correctly and, and have some control over the local streets. How, how do you envision, I guess, to keep that momentum going? Do you see um, some of those partnerships with to provide that, that safety and comfort level that is needed for the tourism industry. Apologies, is that is that meant for us? Yeah, I think it's 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 for for you um, because you're working with such these great partners like the Broadway League and Times Square Alliance and all of the folks that comprise the parts of the the local part of the piece of the puzzle for tourism and cultural affairs. Um, and their testimony is bringing up their concern about making sure the city is safe and welcoming. That is the first thing that both of their testimonies uh, talk about, as well as funding and the, and the partnership for that. I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on providing that, because obviously, as the city, city transitions back into full capacity, providing and taking back streets and taking back hotel rooms and taking back that safety component. I guess, what do you envision for 2022 to continue to provide that, that safety level that's so part of uh, the tourism industry. Yeah, I, obviously it is critical for us and we, we do get uh, quite a bit of feedback from our travel partners as well as consumers. So continuing the efforts to maintain safety is, is core to our message. And we, we absolutely have uh, become a repository for the most up-to-date information for travelers on our website. There are the most Traffic pages on our site have been our coronavirus resources uh, and information updates. So our, our travelers are interested. At times, they are confused. So we, we take special care to explain exactly what is happening here. And we want to make sure they are getting a very accurate picture. We've done man-on-the-street interviews with people waiting online for Broadway shows uh, so that they can speak directly to potential travelers on how great an experience they're having and how wonderful it's been You know, walking the streets of Times Square and wherever it is they are, US Open, Bronx Zoo. We've, we've put them out all over the boroughs. We want people to know what is really happening here. Uh, and also, I think the efforts we've made from, from a coronavirus perspective and, and how we've maintained our levels and how we've really led the way in the, that part of the recovery, travelers are appreciative of that. And they, uh, I think from even a meeting planner perspective, I mean, these are things that we're touting as a city uh, because the, the folks that are out there traveling now, they, they, need, they wanna know and they care. So those types of things, just like sustainability, those are the things that travelers really look to. Um, so we, we heavily promote the strides that we are making. Uh, the, the safety piece is something obviously it, that it is something we are watching and we, we, we try to make sure that we are communicating as openly as we can with, with travelers to let them know what's, what's happening. But yes, it's absolutely something that is top of mind for us and, and for travelers. And I, I thank you for that because the, the coordination and cooperation um, it can't be voices from different aspects. It has to be a joint voice. So as, as council members and as legislators, when we hear that voice and we take action. So I think the, the, the better that we can focus on those topics together so it's not piecemeal out. And public safety is sometimes not 
thought about in this sector, and it has to be. So I think it's important to have your voice and those here. And I think, Jimmy, the last thing I'm just going to just for EDC is Bianca still here from, from EDC. There you are. Um, I guess your role in this, you know, New York and companies laid out a, a, a vision to bring us back. And it's from domestic to international. Um, and so much of that falls within the umbrella of the Great Economic Development Corporation. So I guess, wh where do you see and how are you partnering with New York and company and, and the different components of the tourism and hospitality sectors um, for, for the end of this quarter and beyond? Sure. Um, I think similarly to what uh, Donna and Nancy said that we, we did partner closely with the All in NYC campaign um, last year. And I think going forward, EDC's tourism, I think sector, I'm, we're kind of limited. Um, but we do, you know, we did restart cruises at the terminals, and we also are running public markets in, in the different boroughs. So um, we're looking forward to continuing those efforts. Well, is, is there an aspect, I, I, you know, EDC's broad planning and projects, capital, local, and, and the development of different industries, obviously that will affect the different components within the hospitality sectors. Do you see any uh, capital projects or different funding plan that could benefit the tourism industry going forward? Because so much of the New York and company and their partners were, were survived on, on the different funding that came through on a federal level and stimulus funding. But I, I like to make sure that that stream is continued beyond stimulus funding because so much of the budget is dependent on tourism in New York City and sometimes we forget that. So I think EDC's role will be instrumental. And, and once that funding package ends, that we can make sure that New York and company has the ability to go forward. I just, I guess your vision for that, and do you see any change in budgetary approach or different ways that EDC can affect or assist that industry? Yeah, I think we're still doing kind of a comprehensive lesson learned from COVID and how it's affected EDC's budget. Um, and we're gonna, I think, you know, try and incorporate what we've learned from COVID and how tourism and, you know, where our budget um, maybe is at risk going forward. Um, yeah, I think, Bianca, that would be, I think that would be a key partnership. I think what, what we just heard through, through the, the first panel is, is, is making sure that city agencies, city government, EDC, and the folks that make the hospitality, tourism um, industry so vibrant, EDC has to be uh, part and parcel of that going forward with through budget, through assistance, through how the capital is planned, how the local programming is planned, how the five boroughs are envisioned, how we go beyond Manhattan, as Jimmy and I have always fought to bring Queens into the picture beyond, and that has happened. You know, these last eight to 12 years, that has definitely happened. This, the, the breadth of it has reached the outer boroughs finally. That's, that's what I see EDC's uh, future within that. I think that's the great work that you do. Um, has to be partnered with these, these conversations that Dr. and Nancy have put together for us. And that would be my hope. Okay, so Chair Van Bramer, I'd, uh, I'm sorry about that, but there was so much to, so many different components of this hearing. And I, I just would feel negligent if we didn't touch all of them. So I appreciate your patience on that. I happily turn over to you. And then for the panels that are right after, once Chair Van Bramer is finished, we're gonna go right to the panels. And I know some of the testimony has been submitted and anyone other, the council members wanna jump in and raise a hand, uh, council member Van Bramer and I will, will let you speak at that point. So Chair Van Bramer, it's all yours. Thank you, uh, Chair Vallone. I love your passion for uh, this work and it comes through in, in your questioning and uh, I share that. And again, we've, we've done a lot of great work together uh, and uh, made this a top priority together. So I really appreciate your partnership and your friendship, uh, um, Chair Vallone. Uh, I, I um, you know, I, I remember a few years ago, I told uh, Fred Dixon uh, this story. My husband and I were in Amsterdam and we were thrilled to see advertisements for uh, folks to come to New York City that were particular to Pride Month. Um, and uh, it made us very happy. I think I took a photo of it and texted it to Fred and said, uh, thank you for this ad. We're here in Amsterdam. Uh, feeling very, uh, very proud at the moment of our city and NYC company. Um, but it calls to mind uh, the, 
what I assume is is a is a plan and a and a ramp up of advertising overseas to remind folks that we're open and that Broadway is open. Our our major culturals are open, and uh, and of course our um, Queens and Brooklyn and neighborhood based uh, uh, arts groups are open as well. But maybe NYC and Company can talk a little bit about that that plan, that ramp up, that strategy to uh, to have those ads as we saw them, I think, outside of the Van Gogh uh, Museum uh, uh, that day several years ago in Amsterdam. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. We have we have basically two phases to our out-of-home media. So previously, prior to the grant that we received, we were very forward with the out-of-home media. That drove our international partnerships. This year, because of the additional funding, that's been a, a great sort of awareness building overlay to the media that we can now offer those partners. So we do expect to have a lot more ROI to the campaigns, which is which is great. Uh, but we do have some creative up live. If you, if you saw the NYC Misses You creative internationally, we had quite a bit of that running just while we were sort of, again, keeping the flame burning for our international visitors. We've replaced that with New York City is ready to welcome you as we begin to de develop these international partnerships that I mentioned. So the first one just went live last week with British Airways. So you'll see our signage all over London. We have quite a bit of inventory in London. Then we'll be closely followed by Canada, Mexico. We're, we're in discussions with several other partners in Germany, Korea, and so on. So we will have 10 partnerships in 10 international countries uh, through to the end of the year launching, and it will continue into Q1 with some markets that we we're obviously watching, but they're not ready to execute like Australia and China. We are reserving and just trying to keep the, you know, the, the button ready to push when, when those markets are ready. But we've got, we've got at least 10 going live. So we've been in conversations with our international partners for some time as we sort of were hurry up and waiting for this day. And then once November 8th was announced, we went fairly full force. So uh, you will see our signage everywhere once again um, within the next month to two months. We will be live in ten markets, uh, but right now you 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 that that signage is up in London, and then it will stagger as these partnerships are are completed. Uh, that's great, thank you. And is that a direct spend, or is that as you mentioned through partnerships? Because this gets to your budget, right? So how much of that is is direct spend that's tied to your budget? And how much of that is is agreements, partnerships, uh, you know, you're working with other folks and getting that space, but it's not necessarily um, a real heavy lift on the budgetary side. The the out of home in particular is within our existing JC to co inventory. So that is not an incremental spend, but we are layering on the value to give over to the partner. We are then making a direct spend out of the uh, out of the stimulus funds to the partner as well as in media that will drive attention to that partnership. So it's it just allowing it to be a lot more robust, the more we can promote to the air, to the airline or tour operators following. So coming to being able to come to the table with a digital buy with that partner, uh, it, it absolutely allows us to generate a lot more awareness where normally it would be a very small investment plus the out of home. So we are deploying uh, a significant amount of the, of the funding that we received as working dollars in media, direct with the partner in many cases, and also in third party media in the market to drive awareness around the combined efforts. So we try to create a, a very integrated ecosystem with the partner. So we will advertise in the region, serve up a, what we call a warm lead, uh, someone who's, you know, back activity we're kind of tracking online. If we think they're expressing an interest in travel, we'll send that lead over to the partner website. So for example, British Airways site for them to book their trip to New York. And then they'll send that person back to us for planning purposes on things to do and tickets to buy, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so the money has been being uh, directed to those sorts of efforts. So either on the, on the partners channels, as well as on third party channels to generate the, the broader reach. Um, I find this work fascinating. I really do. I think it's uh, really important and, and not enough people follow it in, in New York City because uh, it's, it's, it's how we uh, support our city and, and the sectors that are dependent on uh, tourism. And, and it's, it involves a lot of strategy and it, it involves a lot of uh, work behind the scenes uh, to make sure that folks 
overseas um, want to keep coming here. Obviously, people will always want to come to New York City because it's so uh, great, but uh, it doesn't hurt to remind them how wonderful we are. Um, and obviously, your budget, um, you know, is one that we've always wanted to be more robust. And um, and obviously, this will be a, a question for another administration and another uh, city council. But uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, that you all are, are going to get uh, the resources that you need to continue the work post stimulus. Um, I, uh, Chair Vallone mentioned this a little bit, but I'm I'm fascinated by um, the ramp up in in our our tourism numbers, right? And I think um, uh, you know Donna talked a little bit about this, but. At our peak, we were in the 65 million range, right, of, of tourists coming to the city after that 10 year um, incremental and sometimes not so incremental uh, increase in, in visitorship. And, and of course, it, it, it fell um, dramatically. Do you have a, a, a five year, 10 year goal, right? Is there, uh, are, we, are we charting it? I know that's almost impossible because there are so many variables here. Um, including variants, but uh, but do we have like KPIs that we're looking at that um, that will give us some sense of where we're going and what our targets are? Is that we work? Thank you for the question. We work very closely with one of the leading uh, economics firms in the industry, Tourism Economics. It is an Oxford economics company and they work with us to understand the economic forces, the access to New York and New York City's own assets, what we have to offer to these global markets, whether it's the California vacationer or the school break person from South America or Europe or Asia. And so when we look at where we are right now, what our pace of recovery has been to date, what the concerns are of the travelers, because we're also constantly taking the pulse of our potential travel market. What are their concerns? What are their financial aspects? We're in an interesting position in terms of for many people with the capability to do long-haul travel, international or transcontinental, their jobs have not been affected. There is a lot of pent-up demand. There is a lot of additional savings. There is a lot of room on people's credit cards to run up some bills again because they paid down those credit cards during the pandemic when there was nothing else to do. So from an economic perspective, our potential markets are economically able to travel. They're waiting for their visas or their permits or their comfort levels to pick up. The American travel market we will be watching very closely coming into the holidays, but it does look as if our hotels are beginning to see very short window booking. People are not sure they wanna plan a very far way out from a trip, but our weekend performance in an increasing number of hotel rooms every week as more properties have opened and new properties have come online is in some weekends running at nearly 85%. The, what's weakening the hotel performance is that midweek number, which is still dependent on business travel, which is still soft, although getting better. And the international visitor who comes and stays a week and is here on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, because they're on vacation. The domestic travel, we're always been a weekend getaway. New York is wonderful on the weekends. So the resiliency of this city as a city and our industry in it is something we should never take for granted. It takes work. 
It takes partnership and cooperation and good support. But people who know me know I've been in this job since the post 9-11 period. And I've watched us suffer and come back from 9-11, from recessions, and now from this global change. Um, I'm a New Yorker. We will come back and probably faster than my forecast, but please don't hold me to that. Uh, I appreciate that. I also appreciate your defiant love of New York. And, uh, and uh, I, I too have uh, been blessed to uh, only be a New Yorker for my entire life. Um, but I would go even a step further along with Chair Vallone and say that uh, I've been a Queens resident for all 52 years of my life and very proud of that. So um, speaking of, of Queens, uh, um, you know, I know we've touched on it, but, but uh, you know, talk uh, a little bit about your support and, 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 and the resources you direct to reminding folks that while we acknowledge how important uh, Manhattan uh, is uh, and and uh, the big commercial uh, and um, central cultural hubs that we have there, and they are incredibly valuable. Um, there is nothing like the Met to the Museum of Natural History and all of those great institutions that I love. But uh, we also know that there is a great big borough of Brooklyn uh, and Queens and and the Bronx and Staten Island with lots to offer too. And and how do we uh, always remind folks, um, like when the U.S. Open is happening, that when we see all of those well-dressed folks uh, on the seven train, which we <laughs> um, uh, sometimes like, um, we we want to make sure that they um, they get off uh, at Sunnyside and Woodside and Jackson Heights and Corona and Flushing, and spend some of that uh, Midwestern dollars here in our beloved Queens. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. We, we have a five borough strategy. It's core to our mission. And, and quite frankly, it's the only way that we can promote a, an authentic experience in New York City for, for travelers who more and more uh, every year are looking for more of an authentic experience. We certainly promote the iconic attractions that are particularly uh, relevant for a first time visitor. But those visitors that continue to come back multiple times, the UK visitor is a great example. Uh, in particular, we have to ensure that we are promoting our, our local attractions and our businesses in order to, to ensure that we are properly promoting New York City. It takes a few different forms. So I would say there's an always on approach in our content and our press efforts. So you will see in our channels daily, whether it's our website or our social channels or in our press channels, uh, every business that we can possibly promote within the boroughs, the restaurants, the, the culturals, that's an endemic part of our coverage. We've also recently launched several content packages that are evergreen, uh, the Black Experience in NYC, the Latino Experience in NYC, and then we will be launching the Asian Experience in NYC, which are evergreen hubs that we will use to showcase the businesses and the business owners throughout the boroughs, again, that make for a very culturally diverse experience that our locals are looking for and our travelers are looking for. So that, that is something that is, again, always on. And then within our initiatives, we do take special care within our membership team and our community affairs team under Shadon Smith and Shadon Simpson to physically go out to as many businesses throughout the boroughs to ensure that if they have a desire to participate in our programs and hopefully reach the economic benefit of those programs, that they can do so. So those that can range from things like neighborhood getaways, which is again, an always on offers platform to showcase local businesses uh, that exist today. And we've had since last uh, summer and then our vibrancy campaign. So example, for example, our restaurant week, uh, must see week for the culturals. And then we've created new programs such as It's Time for Culture that is only for that sector, which ran for the month of October. So we, we, we're always looking for opportunities to highlight them with offers that are perhaps more transactional, directing to what is open right now, and then the content experiences. And also from a B2B perspective, we have campaigns like Tourism Ready, which helps local businesses who are interested in selling to the travel trade. It is a very strange world and you do have to have a particular way of packaging your offering to sell the travel trade. So that is a free program that we are now in our 
sixth year of offering where we will, and I, and as a former member of NYC and company, I actually took this course before coming to work here. And it was a, a game changer for our organization. So that really helps shepherd small businesses through the system to help them uh, package up their offering. And then we take them from there and help integrate them into some of the international sales missions. There are a lot of virtual opportunities still available where we can get them in front of the travel trade and meeting planners all around the world. So we kind of take them through our path once they're ready to do so. So we want to make sure that it, it who, Ever is able to take advantage of the economic benefit and awareness of what we do can do that. So again, on the on the front end through our programs and content, on the back end through programs like Tourism Ready and our various member events and networking opportunities, where we can help them partner with other organizations in their in their area. Uh, thank I you. I would like. And, oops, sorry about that. I'm Sam. sorry. If, I I just wanted to add um, from the research perspective two things. One, a lot of the effort that Nancy and her team and our sales and development team work with is based on tracking research that we've been doing here at NYC and Company, where we know that visitors from out of the city, out of state, and out of the country are traveling and spending money in all of the neighborhoods and the boroughs of New York. And we are working on some very exciting big data opportunities that are moving more slowly than as a researcher I would have liked. But um, this is something that we are able to actually show. We've been doing it for years. Um, started with a, a report that we worked on with the Visa credit card company. And it's confidential, it's not identified but we can see a steady increase in particularly international travel into neighborhoods um, beyond the central business district of Manhattan and across the boroughs. And I challenge any of you to play a game I play with my colleagues, which is take a picture on the subway and ask someone, tourist or local? And if they can't hear them speak, my guess is they will get it wrong more often than they'll get it right because our visitors no longer stand out and look different. They look and sound a lot like our marvelously diverse city. And we are sometimes not aware that that family walking down the street in front of us. And I just have to add, I'm a Bronx girl, sorry. Um, not sorry, I'm a Bronx girl, but for the Queens members of the committee. Um, in the Bronx, there's a very large international travel component that is, some of it is friends and family, some of it is driven by the attractions in the borough, some of it is simply visitors who come to explore from the Botanic Garden to baseball to the food and culture from the South Bronx to the North Bronx. So it's there and we are tracking it. Um, well, while I appreciate folks who spend money going to Yankee Stadium, I have to say you lost me there as a lifelong <laughs> Mets fan. But, um, uh, and, and uh, speaking of uh, all the love for the boroughs, uh, Majority Leader Combo um, from the great uh, borough of Brooklyn um, is up next. I just have one last question before uh, Majority Leader Combo. Um, addresses the panel, uh, because you mentioned uh, uh, some various targeted efforts, and uh, I sort of alluded it to it with the, the Amsterdam events that we saw a few years ago, my husband and I, but obviously the LGBTQ traveler, and um, uh, while not uh, all of us are able to um, uh, travel, um, uh, many, uh, many folks are and, and enjoy that experience, and, and how, how are you um, working with and, and uh, making sure we get the most uh, visitorship from the LGBTQ community. We are really uh, Nancy, start, uh, can I just start with a, a bit yeah, of data again? Uh, that's what happens when you put the research head on the, on the talk. Um, New York City is the number one destination in the US for the LGBT plus markets. We are continued to be that right up 
through the first quarter of 2020, as almost everyone who could travel sort of shifted to beach and mountain, the um, community went the same way. But recent surveys continued to put New York as a top of mind, highly desirable destination for the LGBT communities and that is domestic as well as international. Um, certainly New York hosted World Pride in 2019 to extraordinary success and we're riding into 2020 with a very positive image of the city. Um, I am tracking attendance at the Stonewall Monument, which is a national monument, and people are coming into New York and visiting the Stonewall Monument, even in the pandemic. So I think that it is a small measure, but a continuing measure of the position that New York holds in the hearts and minds of our community. Sorry yeah. to cut you off, Nancy. No, not at all. That's great. I, I, and I would just add that as part of the campaign, our media strategy was, was designed to uh, target what we call, there are two segments, the travel dreamers and the travel ready. Again, we launched this in June and we were really needing to be a lot more aggressive as people began to contemplate travel. So that's about 51 million people. And within that, we did notice early on that the LGBTQ segment was among the first to travel. So that's really something we're addressing in our audience targeting and the partnerships that we have upcoming uh, with from a branded content perspective with media partnerships in the LGBTQ space. So we'll, we're uh, RFPing that now and developing that. It's a little bit more of a deeper content experience versus just an ad. So that should begin launching uh, be, probably next month in December into Q1, uh, because we, we obviously recognize the value of that travel traveler and are, are working very in a concerted effort to make sure that we, we remain top of mind. Thank you, I appreciate um, all of that. And uh, again, I, I uh, really find uh, your work fascinating uh, and, and uh, uh, deeply, deeply, uh, appreciate all that uh, you all do behind the scenes to, to make uh, all of this possible. Uh, I have more questions, but I know that uh, Majority Leader Combo um, has her hand raised and um, Brooklyn has not been heard from enough today. So I will um, invite Majority Leader Combo to uh, join us. Starting time. Hello. We can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm doing a lot of double duty today. My son is homesick. And so you hear the cartoons in the back and um, <laughs> trying to navigate a lot of things, but I'm so happy that this hearing is taking place. I wanted to ask a question um, in terms of federal funding. Um, many of our not-for-profit organizations, as well as um, organizations that are not not-for-profit, but are cultural huge tourism um, boosters for the city. My question is, do we know what percentage of our cultural institutions um, on the for-profit or not-for-profit side received federal subsidies or funding um, during the COVID pandemic? And I'm just saying, I'm prefacing that by also asking my concern is, a lot of the organizations have been propped up through additional funding, federal funding, even through the council, what we were able to allocate. But my concern will be, where will these organizations, both for-profit and not-for-profit, um, how will they fare um, when federal subsidy is not, um, is not as robust as it is currently? I don't I think... Go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to say, I could, I could take a stab at that um, majority leader. Um, so yes, you are correct. A lot of the cultural organizations received um, federal funding. I don't have the exact breakdown. I can tell you that we worked with, um, with our network to make sure people were aware of the opportunities to secure federal funding, whether it's Save Our Stages or the PPP program. Um, we worked with them to ensure that they had competitive applications. 
I can look into the exact breakdown for you later, but I don't have that off the top of my head. I think even if that type of documentation hasn't been done at this point, I think it would be very helpful to understand and learn um, how has federal funding impacted organizations? What's the percentage of them that received it so that we know or we have a better understanding of the landscape so that while things are opening up and things aren't at full capacity, um, a lot of that was able to happen because of federal funding and, and that level of support. But once that level of federal support leaves and we still have certain mandates in place, I feel like that's where the rubber is gonna meet the road in terms of where the challenges are gonna really begin. Um, because many organizations have been able to um, exist because of the fact that they had the federal subsidies. Yeah, and I would also just, that's true, and I'd also echo that because of our partnership with the council, you all have been very generous as well in us being able to give out more money. I mean, last year we had a record budget of $230 million, so I, I know that that's not going to happen every year, but it was a good year in that regard to help a lot of our cultural organizations and particularly the smaller based community organizations that actually were not able to access the PPP program as much as um, others were. So I agree concern and uh, we can certainly look into that and get back to you with the numbers. Uh, my other question is, is more on the health side and I apologize if um, this was touched upon. So I would imagine in all sectors, but I, I would just taking a, a, a stab in the, in the dark on this, that in the cultural sector, the issues around immunization um, and getting the vaccine is going to be more robust and deeper in the cultural community than maybe perhaps other sectors. Um, have there been any discussions or understandings in terms of vaccination rates in the cultural community? And have there been because we're experiencing this um, in the opening of the Bedford Union Armory in my district, that many of the not-for-profits are having lots of issues with doing after-school programs, their educational programs, bringing um, staff back to work who have now refused to get the vaccine. Are, have, and some people actually have actual medical reasons as to why they can't get the vaccine. Has there been a thought in terms of, or any discussion around how we navigate within the cultural sector, um, individuals not getting the vaccine? I think that's a topic, a topic that many um, cultural leaders have been looking at, particularly for their own staff. And um, I think early on when the vaccine mandates were being uh, discussed and then eventually implemented. Uh, we worked with the Department of Health to hold several briefings with the Culture at Three group uh, to get that information out there. Um, you know, I, I think we're, we see this, uh, yes, it's happening in the cultural sector. I think it's happening everywhere. There's some, uh -huh. there's some people that just are not, for whatever reasons, are not comfortable getting the vaccine, whether it's a health reason, or a religious reason, there are just some folks that are not interested in that and uh, are not doing it. Um, but we have been working with our cultural partners to ensure that they have the information that DOHMH provides and the state and the city, uh, excuse me, state and the federal government have also provided to help ensure more confidence in the vaccines as they're doing their public education efforts as well. Okay, I think, um... And bringing the culture and economic uh, committees together, I again think that those are really critical issues as far as um, what's going to happen when the federal funding is no longer um, at the level that it was, as well as once the what once organizations have to begin to operate without that level of deep subsidy and they're not able to attract the staff. Um, and the individuals and the teaching artists um, to run those programs, I'm concerned about that time frame, or, 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 or what happens when those um, issues, I guess, collide or, or come together in some way. So it's just something to uh, put out there in terms of getting the numbers of understanding 
how is the cultural community being impacted by the vaccines um, and staff opting to take the vaccine or not opting to take the vaccine? Also, which organizations have qualified for the federal funding um, and which ones have not or didn't know about it? So I'll end my, my questions there and thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, we will now hear from Council Member Carnegie who has a question. Uh, good, good morning. Um, I want to thank uh, the chairs, both um, Valone and Van Brema, for, for hosting this hearing. Um, uh, I just think that the coordinated effort for true recovery and resiliency um, should include uh, SBS. Or, uh, you know, and so the, the, the chair, Mark Jonah, and I have had conversations, as the former chair, I've had conversations about this recovery and resiliency. And while in the past, it may have seemed that the three could operate in, in these silos. I'm glad that there's a coordinated effort, obviously, between cultural affairs and economic development. I would just love to loop in SBS because as we try to build back for a true recovery and resiliency without a coordinated effort between three, I think, um, um, you know, it, it's going to make it really difficult. We, we seem to be, if I'm out and about, whether it's in Nolita or Flatbush or, or the Upper West Side, people seem to be adapting to coming back and the city seems to be on an upturn and an uptick, which leads me to believe that there's an opportunity for better coordination. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts were uh, on, on that, Both the panelists, for example. I, we have had regular uh, interaction and dialogue with SBS throughout the last 18 months and, and really made a concerted effort to share information, resources. Um, we went to SBS when we were looking for agency partnerships to ensure that we were talking to the right small businesses right in our own community um, from a marketing standpoint. So we, we definitely agree and would look forward to, to more of that moving forward. But but yes, yeah, so we, 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 we do value the partnership we have and we have appreciated the dialogue we've had thus far. But yeah, we agree we would continue. We would look to continue that moving forward as well. I want to thank the chairs for setting a precedent for coordination and hopefully uh, their successors and the successors of all the agencies will see the necessity for continued coordination, especially as we look for true recovery and resiliency. Again, thank you for the chairs uh, for, for hosting this hearing and thank you for the panelists for all the uh, wealth of information that you've given today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Carnegie. We'll now turn it back to Chair Ballone for some additional questions. I know Chair Van Bremen has some questions. I just wanted to thank both our majority leader and Council Member Cornegy. I think Jimmy and I have been screaming for interagency cooperation has been my favorite term um, for about eight years. And I think small business is critical to this component. So I thank him for those components. And I know Jimmy mentioned it. And I want to also, if you could express our gratitude to, our, to Fred Dixon for his leadership um, and, you know, there's been a, a few bills and a few budgetary ideas that we've had extensive conversations on how to always bring the proper tools to New York and company as a, I guess, a subsidiary of, of EDC and, and to make sure that the realization of its importance um, is, is seen on a budgetary priority, on a legislative priority, with over the 50 council members working hand in hand, and especially with the amount of responsibilities that have been placed at your doorstep during pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and as we're coming out of uh, the pandemic, which I, I think we all believe. Uh, my, my last question would be, I think, is there any, I guess, guidelines or determining factors maybe in some of our neighboring European countries that have maybe opened the doors a little earlier than we have to see how their international tourism programs are going as some type of I guess, guideline or benchmark for New, for New York and the United States, but for our focus here is have we seen any, I, I, you know how you mentioned some of the partnerships with British Airways and England and France. Can we, can we guide some of the progress there in the EU or some of the other countries since they opened a little earlier than we have to maybe see the quarterly and annual progress there? Is there anything that we can use? We have recently discussed re-engaging what we call our city to city partnerships uh, that we've had for several years where we really are swapping media assets, sharing key learnings and best practices and uh, which 
it may not may or may not be a surprise, but they are actually continuing to look to us for guidance. No um, surprise there, none whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, and it, it, it quite honestly, the more we talk to our colleagues, um, as now we've been at all kind of attending the global conferences again and been interacting over the over the last you know year and a half. Uh, we're all essentially following a similar playbook with the concentric circle approach. Everybody was sort of forced to talk to their locals and citizens, perhaps for the first time in some countries. At least we had some precedents for doing that with our vibrancy campaigns, which were largely locals at tri-state anyway. But there were many areas of the world that had never spoken to a local. So they came to us very early on with, you know, what are you doing and how do you do it? And how do you then expand that relevancy now that that's really, you know, you're fishing where the fish are. So uh, a lot of our, our, our comrades were not really used to doing that. So we've been in a sort of unofficial dialogue with them over the last year and a half and now looking to start back up uh, city to city partnerships, particularly with our European counterparts to start. Um, but they've been asking us questions all along the way, and we've just been trying to share what it is we're doing. We, we've you know, issued our roadmap, and we'll be following up with a sort of sequel to that uh, later on this year with you know, how we've sort of prepared again, how we fared against the roadmap and um, going into some more detail on that. So we, we, we are happy to share that information with them. Um, and again, I think in principle, we've all been doing a lot of the same things in, in, to different uh, effect, but um, and I guess Nancy, just following that is, but do we have any data from them on how their international tourism percentages have started to rise? I guess in the last quarter, because since they started a little earlier than we did, yeah, something uh, to take a look at. If yeah. We don't have today, but we don't have it. Um, it is something we can look into. And I guess last, I, I think just since we're all on that same page, I think my last not so much question or, or maybe concern is. Some of the vaccination guidelines are, are still, as we kind of feel our way through this, you know, it, what we're accepting into New York City and maybe in Broadway is, is what we're understanding is a little bit different than what the restaurants are accepting. And there's some um, confusion and, and concern that if you go to see a show, but then the restaurant will accept the same vaccination, I guess, protocols, I hate that word, um, that we're accepting in different areas. I think we have to coordinate whether we're just accepting the three um, vaccinations that we've accepted here in, in the United States and New York, or we're going to accept the, the global WH vaccination guidelines, which are a little bit different because there is some difference in policies and guidelines on what you can use to get it to see a show versus what you can use and accept it at a restaurant. And that's hindering some of the flow because that's what you want to do is a continuation of activities once you're into the boroughs of New York City. The last thing you want to do is be able to go see something but not be accepted someplace else. So uh, I don't know if we're, we're working toward coordinating and unifying that, but there is a difference out there. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're doing as much as we can to share the information as it becomes available. And it, it has been, uh, as it's been changing and evolving over time. So that information uh, is top of mind for us because it's top of mind for travelers. People, we don't want people to be confused. In some cases, they are, and particularly we work very closely with the Hospitality Alliance. And particularly, as you mentioned, in that sector, it's a concern on a few levels with compliance as well. So we're doing the best we can to make sure people know what those guidelines are before they arrive, um, and also when they when they get here. So, to your point, consistency is key. Uh, but we work very hard to try to make sure we continue to share that in a very clear, concise way so people can a little bit more easily navigate it um, on our on our sites and our channels. And again, we, we want to do whatever possible with our counterparts to to make it as seamless and clear as, as possible, because you're right, there, there's there is some amount of confusion. So we're helping to dispel that so people understand when they arrive what to expect. It's, it's key to the visitor experience. Well, I guess if, if the sooner we can rectify that, the better. We don't want, especially with the holidays upon us, uh, somebody being turned away one place where they're accepted another. So if we can maybe even temporarily try to suspend that or give it a universal where as long as you're vaccinated, it will be approved. That'd be a huge help to the small businesses, restaurants, and hotels. Uh, and now I'd like to tear it over to my friend and co-chair, Jimmy Van Brick. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Vallone. And I um, just want to say, uh, Deputy Commissioner Feinberg, uh, thank you for mentioning the uh, 
we received record funding at the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, this past year, obviously something that uh, I'm very proud of and Majority Leader Cumbo um, and the entire council um, is proud of. And you mentioned that, you know, that you may not be able to expect that level of funding every year. Uh, I hope you're right, but I hope that it's more funding uh, that you get uh, in the coming years. From your lips to God's ears, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sure. Um, uh, obviously, you know, I have a great uh, respect for Commissioner uh, Casals, um, uh, but whomever will be the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs um, uh, next year, uh, I'm sure would also appreciate uh, an increase in funding uh, for the agency. Uh, I just want to thank um, uh, all of you. I know we have other folks, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it brief this time and just say, I appreciate uh, Majority Leader Cumbo um, uh, talking about our, our culturals uh, and uh, obviously the focus in particular on our smaller um, neighborhood and community-based culturals and Council Member Cornegy talking about uh, small businesses. And of course, so many of our small culturals are in fact small businesses, uh, which I know uh, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo and, and uh, Council Member uh, Cornegy also uh, I have a great deal of respect um, and fondness for. So um, thank you very much for all the information. And um, again, appreciate uh, Chair Valone and I working together on this. It's always great fun. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, we will now turn to the public portion of this testimony, uh, of this hearing rather. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each public panelist will be given five minutes to speak. So please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and we will call on you in the order that you raised your hand. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and then the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Uh, I would like to now call Thomas Ferrugia to testify. And after Mr. Ferrugia, we will hear from Sane Wright and then Sarah Cecilia Bukowski. Uh, Mr. Ferrugia, you may begin as soon as the sergeants announce the time. Starting time. Good morning. Um, I did submit a, a longer statement. Uh, for the record, but I do have a, a shorter version to read to try to get in under five minutes. I think I should be able to do it. Um, good morning again. I'm Tom Ferrugia with the Broadway League. We thank uh, Chairman Bramer and uh, Valone, as well as the members of the Committees on Cultural Affairs and Economic Development for allowing us to participate in this hearing. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Speaker Johnson and Council Member Powers, who represents this district, for their unwavering support for the live entertainment industry. Prior to the pandemic, Broadway drove an average of 40,500 theater goers to Midtown Manhattan each day. Based on our 2018 to 2019 theater season, which was our last complete season, uh, Broadway grossed $1.829 billion on 14.8 million tickets, averaging $35 million per week on 284,000 admissions. In 2019, 46% of admissions were tourists living outside New York City and the surrounding suburbs, while 19% were visitors from abroad. Broadway drew this healthy foreign audience from all over the world, comprising the highest number of international visitors in all of Broadway's history. The average foreign, foreign born tourist saw 2.3 two shows and stayed in the city for 6.7 days. Broadway motivated foreign spending on ancillary activities, excluding the cost for their theater tickets, excluding the cost for the theater tickets, exceeded $2.9 billion. While we do anticipate losing a large portion of domestic tourists this coming year, our biggest fear is that foreign visitors uh, still represent our most at-risk theater goers. We would like to highlight several policies for encouraging visitors to return to Manhattan and helping sustain Broadway's economic growth. As Councilman Vallone has already mentioned, uh, theater safety we feel is a uh, significant factor. Uh, area safety is a significant factor for returning visitors. And there has been a proliferation of aggressive vendors who often attempt to harass victims into paying for photographs in Times Square. We therefore thank 
the council for passing the aforementioned uh, intro 1811, which addresses many of these concerns. However, as always, as with everything, we believe that active police enforcement and oversight by this body is going to be critical to ensuring that this new law achieves its goals. We also believe access to Midtown remains a vital and continual uh, remains vital and the continual addition of sidewalks and bicycle lanes, clogging streets and making vehicular access to the theater district needlessly complicated seems like a short sighted approach to addressing a larger problem. Visitors should be welcomed, regardless of their means of transport, not exacerbated by a lack of pickup and drop off access. For example, in addition to the many changes that have already been made to accommodate bicyclists, the city recently installed another bike lane along the east side curb on 7th Avenue Midtown and relocated street parking into what was formerly a car lane, thus fully eliminating two vehicular lanes. When vehicles frequently double park, traffic is then forced into a single lane. This traffic then clogs up even further as these vehicles must eventually turn off 7th Avenue into the, into the theater district. We do acknowledge the need for bicycles, but we recommend that local businesses are given an opportunity to meaningfully participate in the decisions that directly impact their customers. We are already experiencing near gridlock, nonstop horn honking and inconvenience for the more than 15% of theater goers who come, who come to Broadway every week by car. Finally, we ask the city council to revisit Councilman Powers' proposal, proposals to reform the commercial rent tax, which has been discussed by this council many times, a regressive assessment that creates a disincentive to operating businesses in Midtown. Intro 1371 would provide measured relief to taxpayers with incomes of less than 10 million or who pay less than $800,000 a year in rent. And intro 1372 would end the tax on billboard advertisements in the theater district. As the economy struggles to recover and we work to rebuild our audiences, we feel that the city council, the city, must focus on removing undue financial obstacles and supporting financial growth. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. As always, we look forward to continued collaboration with the council to ensure that New York City remains the cultural and financial capital of the world. And I do have some data, uh, if anyone would be interested in talking later, some numbers about how Broadway is doing and how things have been over the, the last couple of weeks compared to uh, uh, how our numbers are have been historically. Thank you. Tom, thank you for the testimony. We do have the written testimony and please make sure you tell all of your partners, especially Charlotte, that we are so excited that Broadway's back and we always look forward to working with you and her and the entire organization. I do. I will make one point. Last week, we had our one millionth admission since uh, we opened, since the COVID reopening, since September 2nd. So that was ah, a big, big, uh, big. Uh, uh, we're very happy that we're numbers are moving in the right direction. So well, Jimmy and I come, uh, are responsible for a few of those numbers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about a million, but we're getting there. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferugia. Uh, next, we will hear from Sane Wright and then Sarah Cecilia Bukowski, followed by Lisa Alpert. Uh, Sonny Wright, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Hi, everyone. My name is Sana Wright, and I am the external affairs manager at the Times Square Alliance. Thank you, Chair Ballone, Chair Van Bramer, and members of the committees for their efforts to help New York City recover. We are very grateful for your continued work to support the tourism industry over the past several years. It is no secret that Times Square is the center of the city's tourism industry. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, Times Square was home to 16% of the city's total hotel rooms, driving $2.5 billion in annual revenue. Times Square's theater district, heavily patronized by visitors from across the globe, brought in $12.6 billion in total annual economic impact. Similarly, the district's 668 storefronts generated $168 million in annual sales tax revenue. Today, these numbers look different. Since the pandemic, there has been an 89% decline in hotel occupancy totaling a loss of 417 million in occupancy tax revenue, as well as 89,000 jobs in the tourism sector. In Times Square alone, 70 storefronts have closed. At the height of the pandemic, pedestrian counts fell by 91% to 33,000. We have made strides towards recovery, but over 10 Broadway theaters remain closed and pedestrian traffic, commercial leasing and consumer spending all remain down by 32%, 40% and 60% respectively. If we want over 60 million tourists to return to New York and Times Square annually, we must ensure that the city is at its most safe and welcoming. 
Since before the pandemic, our streets, sidewalks, and plazas have been inundated with people in need, including individuals engaging in open drug use, experiencing mental health crises, and sometimes engaging in criminal, violent, or otherwise disruptive behavior. The current policy of allowing antisocial and illegal activity to occur without intervention is failing. Instead, the city must commit to enforcing against illegal activity and sufficiently fund humane, effective policies to help troubled people find their way off the streets and into treatment and or transitional housing. BIDS and other community-based organizations across the city have the potential to be some of the strongest partners in making our public spaces clean, vibrant, and welcoming to our visitors. Currently, the Alliance partners with the Center for Court Innovation, Breaking Ground, and Fountain House on Community First a program that uses peer community navigators to provide consistent outreach to persons in need on our streets, building trust by offering essentials like food and blankets, and then connecting people to mental health care, transitional housing, benefits, and employment. After a six-month pilot period, Community First received funding from the Department of Social Services to continue its work for the next year. Since mid-July, navigators have engaged with 120 individuals on the street. Through sustained interactions and trust building, 20 of them have accepted longer term support, like housing and drug treatment. Programs like Community First require supportive housing and other social services to be readily available and well functioning, but the city has yet, yet to invest sufficiently in both. If we wish to fully recover, this must be a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Uh, next, we will hear from Sarah Cecilia Bukowski, followed by Lisa Alpert, and then Barbara Blair. Uh, Ms. Bukowski, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Good morning. I'm Sarah Cecilia Bukowski. I'm the research and advocacy assistant at Dance NYC, for a service organization dedicated to the dance workforce here in New York City. Um, I thank you for holding this joint hearing and for addressing some of the key concerns around the arts and cultural sector's role in the return of tourism to the city. And I'd like to take this opportunity to expand on some of the points that directly affect Dance NYC's constituency, which includes small budget organizations and focuses specifically on the needs of BIPOC, disabled, and immigrant arts workers. We know that the arts and culture sector is the number one driver of tourism to the state. We generate $110 billion in economic activity with the nonprofit dance sector contributing $300 million annually. Uh, the average cultural tourist spends approximately $31.47 beyond ticket costs on things like meals, retail, parking, lodging, local transportation, childcare, and souvenirs, to name a few. And these dollars provide vital income to local merchants in tourism related industries. Non-local audience spending is nearly double local audience spending. So that's evidence of the measurable economic rewards um, in, re in attracting cultural tourists. And as the foundation for the city's tourism industry, arts and culture can't operate sustainably without targeted recovery funding and dedicated ongoing support from the city. With gratitude, we believe that there are comprehensive improvements and investments to be made in order for arts and culture to continue as a primary engine for tourism. So first, we request to include arts and cultural businesses in recovery funding for the tourism industry, specifically to comply with public health mandates. Businesses are confronting increased expenses related to mandate compliance and an ongoing loss of revenue due to decreased attendance. And we ask that the city look to relief funds intended to support the recovery of the tourism industry to ensure that arts and cultural businesses can continue to provide programming in compliance with public health regulations. Secondly, uh, we request to prioritize additional funding to organizations experiencing the highest levels of impact from the pandemic. So particularly the hardest hit small budget organizations and acknowledging the disproportionate impact on BIPOC, immigrant and disabled artist communities. Fewer and less representative arts workers and arts organizations in the city directly results in losses to cultural diversity, tourism opportunities and revenue generation across sectors and locales. Um, and third, we request to further expand city funded media campaigns to support the nonprofit arts and culture sector, in addition to Broadway and for profit entertainment. I've been seeing the multi million dollar Welcome Back to New York marketing campaign that puts Broadway front and center, but the city must also recognize that the vibrancy and value of the arts reaches far beyond Broadway. 
and expanding these media campaigns to include nonprofit arts and cultural organizations throughout the five boroughs would not only support their programming, but also bring much needed economic investment and tourist dollars to neighborhoods hardest hit by the pandemic. Taken together, we believe these measures could stand to support arts and culture as a key driver of the tourism economy in the city. We believe that an equitable, sustainable citywide recovery requires a citywide investment in the people, organizations, and industries that drive economic activity and make every neighborhood in this city unique and vibrant. Dance NYC thanks you for your consideration and commends your leadership and ongoing efforts to support the recovery of the arts and culture sector as tourists return to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bukowski. Next, we will hear from Lisa Alpert, followed by Barbara Blair. And as a, a reminder to anybody remaining on who has not uh, submitted testimony or raised their hand to testify, please submit testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov um, within 72 hours of the conclusion of the hearing. Ms. Alpert, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Hi, everyone. Chair Van Bramer, Chair Malone, fellow Brooklynite, Majority Leader Gumbo, everyone else on the call, um, and everyone from NYC, uh, um, NYC and Company for this really great conversation. Um, if anyone on the call is not familiar with Greenwood, you should come visit us. Um, we are um, a very active cultural institution throughout the year, um, have about 250 public programs um, annually. Um, so I just like to add to this dialogue um, in a really passionate and urgent way to make the case that it's especially important that this committee look at the unexpected and unconventional, yet no less popular cultural spaces in New York City like, um, for example, Greenwood Cemetery, um, and support them um, and help them continue to accommodate and serve their audiences. Um, here's just what's going to really surprise you, I think. Um, Greenwood sees a surprisingly high number of visitors um, annually. In 2019, Greenwood had about 300,000 visitors. In 2020, that number doubled. We saw 600,000 visitors to Greenwood in 2020. Um, and with numbers like that, Greenwood became one of the most visited cultural spaces in all five boroughs. Um, so um, in, in 2021, it looks like we're gonna retain about 100,000 of those guys. So we are at, gonna close out the year at about 400,000 visitors um, to this National Historic Landmark here in Brooklyn. And in turn, our local businesses like Bake to Brooklyn, for example, also enjoy a substantial uptick in their receipts at the registers um, based on people coming to Greenwood and then being you know, really exhausted from climbing up and down the hills and, and pathways here and needing some carbohydrates and hot coffee. Um, so currently, um, while we do support, we do receive um, some annual, the annual report from the annual support um, from the Department of Cultural Affairs, we have not yet enjoyed the warm embrace or really any embrace from the city council. <laughs> But we are huggers, uh, and we would be most Here comes grateful. your virtual hug, Lisa. It's coming. It's coming. It's I'm so excited. <laughs> be grateful for a real hug or a financial hug that will help support our uh, growing audiences for cultural programs, environmental programs, and our biggest program of all, so to speak, the visitor services and orientation that serve our 400,000 um, annual visitors. Um, we love welcoming New Yorkers and tourists uh, to Greenwood, and we hope we can partner with you to continue to support their visits, their adjacent economic activity, and the cultural adventure that our visitors have when they visit this national historic landmark. That's it. Thanks for your thanks for your time. Thanks, Lisa. Yep. And thank you, Miss Alpert. Uh, finally, we will hear from Miss Barbara Blair. Uh, again, please submit testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov for all who have not yet done so. Uh, Ms. Blair, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Thank you. My name is Barbara Blair. I'm the president of the Garment District Alliance. Thank you, Chair Vallone and Chair Van Bremer and members of the committees for your help, efforts to help New York City recover after 20 devastating months. The Garment District is situated on Manhattan's west side and le links the 34th Street Penn Station area to Times Square. Because of the central business district location, we have some of the highest pedestrian counts in New York City. 
Additionally, the Garment District has over 50 hotels, hosting 1.9 million visitors to the city a year, and is the site of Penn Station with 600 riders a day and Port Authority with an additional 300 riders a day pre-pandemic. Over the last two years, the district has been negatively impacted by crime. The west side of Manhattan has had some of the highest rates of assaults, robbery, and other violent crime in the city. This is largely a result of individuals in dire need of help, including individuals experiencing mental health challenges, being present in the district, and the unfortunate outcome of over 4,300 individuals in hotels in Manhattan's west side, thus clustering severely ill individuals. Drug dealing and use is in the open, including openly injecting, needles strewn about our streets, individuals passed out on our sidewalks and in our plazas, and the accompanying disorder. Ground floor retailers, including restaurants, are terror terrorized by violent behaviors. Tenants that have returned to our office buildings have rejected conditions and opted to continue to work from home indefinitely, and visitors in the hotels are appalled by what they are witnessing in our great city. For our part, the Garment District Alliance has had 16 assaults on staff members in the last year. If we want over 60 million visitors to return to New York, as the Times Square Alliance said, we must ensure that the city is safe. Since before the pandemic, our streets, sidewalks, and plazas have been inundated with people in need, including individuals engaged in open drug use, experience mental health, experiencing mental health crisis, and sometimes engaging in violent and otherwise disruptive behavior. The current behavior, the current uh, condition of allowing antisocial and illegal activity to occur without intervention is failing. Instead, the city must commit to enforcing against illegal activity and sufficiently fund humane, effective policies to help troubled people find their way off the streets and into treatment. The Garment District and indeed the entire west side of Manhattan, home to our cherished theater industry, the Empire State Building, the 34th Street Shopping Quarter and Times Square are all under assault. We implore the committee to put the safety of our streets, public order, and the insurance that recidivists and repeat offenders will be removed from the public realm and placed in appropriate safe settings wherein the support that they need is available at the very top of your priorities. The Garment District urges you to put public safety at the top of the list of considerations and to include the NYPD in any participating agencies uh, looking at the recovery in, our, in New York City. All right, thank you, Barbara. As you can see, we, we look at those testimonies and I refer to the ones that I had in hand. And from what we heard today, the number one topic was quality of life and public safety affecting those neighboring businesses. So please continue to be part of these dialogues and committee hearings for the next council and mayoral administration to be aware of that uh, and not just hope things are magically going to get better. It's a complete process to make sure that comfortability level is back where it was before the pandemic. So we thank you so much for the testimonies of each of you. Uh, and Lisa, you got your virtual hug, so we have to make sure that the council does include all the hard work that you're doing because as council member Van Bramer did with cultural affairs, I can't tell you the impact that he had with the budget increase with my public schools and my district. Um, we still don't have 100% because I have so many schools, but prior to, to me stepping into office, we basically had zero, and now we almost have a dozen. So uh, just one impact of working together uh, as council members, as agencies, as those who, uh, as Jimmy said, are passionate about this industry and what it has on families and children and international and local visitors. So I think, Alex, to our council, do we have any more uh, panelists for today? Uh, that is it for today, Chair. So am I safe to saying that Chair Van Bremen and I can wrap up? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, yes, you are. I think we basically just did on my point on thanking our panelists and thanking uh, Fred's team and EDC and working with Jimmy and his team and my staff. Uh, if this is our last hearing, it has been truly an honor to be the council member for Northeast Queens and serve as chair of EDC and bring forth these amazing topics on the inter 
cooperation that's necessary and not just assume things happen on its own. It's not the case. And, and having this partnership with council members and delegations and city hall and city agencies and our, our advocates that come and testify is how this is the greatest city in the world. Um, and I hopefully have set a precedent that uh, I know Chair Van Bramer and I uh, will look forward to, and if not, we'll be back to make sure that they follow up on the great work um, that we have done um, because it has to continue. And uh, we couldn't have been as great a council members if we didn't have the amazing staff that we did. And I uh, honestly had almost 100% the same staff I had from day one. So I thank them from the bottom of my heart for, for being part of this team. And I'd like to turn it over to council member Jimmy Van Bramer, who's part of this amazing Queens delegation who has brought Queens onto the map with all the other boroughs. Thank you. Jimmy, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Vallone. And, uh, and you know it's very genuine. I, I, I regard you as uh, an ideal colleague and uh, it's always been a pleasure to work with you. Um, uh, unfailingly uh, generous and, and kind and, uh, and you've accomplished a great deal on behalf of uh, your district uh, the city of New York, and of course, uh, your stewardship of, of this committee and, and all the work that you've done. So I say thank you on behalf of all of us. And, uh, and it is indeed an incredible, incredible legacy uh, that you leave behind for now, should you ever uh, potentially choose to uh, revisit uh, this particular space. But uh, uh, I know that you have a lot more to give uh, to Queens and to New York City, uh, uh, one way or the other. So, uh, so thank you, uh, Chair Vallone, um, and for the partnership. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you to our team members who are uh, here. Uh, I I know that I have uh, uh, one final uh, committee meeting in uh, December that we uh, will talk about libraries, and I'll end that, uh, Chair Vallone, sort of where I began with my love of libraries. Um, so I uh, won't uh, um, go on uh, too long, but uh, it's uh, it's an incredible pleasure uh, to serve with you, and it's uh, an awesome obligation, responsibility, and blessing uh, to have been in this position for the last 12 years on behalf of culture, uh, the arts, and libraries. So uh, thank you, and I, I look forward to, uh, to seeing uh, all the work that we've done continue um, and, uh, and the folks that we've supported continue to be supported. With that, bring in a germ and a closing to today's hearing as Jimmy brought me to tears. Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone.